All right, thank you for that. You guys can go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8, page 7 in your Pew Bible, if you're using the Pew Bible in front of you. And if you're just joining us again for the first time, we are in a series called In the Beginning, where we're looking at the first 11 chapters of the Bible in Genesis. And uh, we are actually on our third week, and we, three weeks ago we kind of mentioned a man named Noah, a uh, familiar story to us, so we're uh, going to be finishing up with the story of Noah next week, so we kind of find ourselves right in the middle of it uh, this morning. So as we begin, uh, just a question that I want all of us to think about. Are there times in life when things happen and we just don't know what to do? Are you ever in that situation? Where you don't have an answer right off the top of your head. You just don't know what to do. You don't know how to respond. You don't know what steps to take. Am I the only one? All right. I'm sure we can agree on that truth. And just recently, our nation was on the edge of our seats waiting to see something um, that no one thought was possible a couple of years ago. Waiting to hear what would happen, to see what would happen. Really shocked the entire nation. Historical, you might say. Um, and you know what I'm talking about. The Cubs won the World Series. <laughs> Now, some of you are thinking the election, okay? Uh, but the Cubs won, and I don't get tired of saying that. That's why I'm saying it this morning. But there is a point to it. My mom always said, if you want to get to me to talk, you talk about Jesus or baseball. So I get to do both this morning, which is awesome. Um, but, you know, we talk about the election as well. That was another one of those moments, right? So it's been a crazy month uh, for many of us, especially here in Chicago. Uh, the relevance of these stories, though, is uh, really, there's a lot of connection between these stories and Noah, um, and a certain question that we start to ask when these things happen. So whether it's the story of Noah, whether it's the Cubs winning, whether it's the uh, election results, there's a question that many people have asked. The question is, now what? Now what? Okay. So if we think about the Cubs, more of the lighthearted in nature, um, not for some of us, but, uh, but when you think about that, the, the question becomes, okay, the Cubs have this 108-year drought, they win the World Series, and then they have this massive parade, and then life goes back to normal, right? Nothing really has changed in my life personally. Some joy, some satisfaction for a while, right? But life gets back to normal. So my question becomes, now what? When I go home and I've been watching this TV for the last three weeks, seeing what's happened like most of you have been, you sit down like, well, what am I supposed to watch now? <laughs> right? It's just over. In a matter of seconds, it's over. And so you start to ask, well, now what do I do? And then you have the election, regardless of where you were on the election and the results, everybody's asking the question, well, now what? Where, where are we going to go from here? What's going to happen? What are we going to think in four years? What's, what's going to come? And so we ask this question, now what? And when we ask that question, there's a few things behind it. Uh, I think there's uh, an anxiety, right? Kind of this anxious feeling, I'm not really sure. There's uh, a concern or an uncertainty with that. And we're really looking for guidance. When we ask that question, now what? We want somebody to say, here's the next few things that are going to happen. Here's the next few steps to take. And that's what we're looking for when we ask that question. When they say, I don't know, it's frustrating, right? We ask this question, now what, all the time in little things and big things. For some of you, you're here and it's more of a personal thing for you. You're, you're asking the question, now what, because of things that are happening in your life. Things that might be different than someone else. So it's a job loss or a job change and you're asking, well, now what? What do I do? Maybe it's a relationship and you don't know what's coming next. And so you're asking, now what? And it's a question that all of us ask. We're asking it now in big things and we're asking it, I'm sure, in more personal things as well. And so I'm guessing in our story this morning, as I was reading it with Noah, that this is a question that would have come to his mind quite a bit. Now what? What's next? What am I supposed to do? And so let's go ahead and read Genesis 8 together. I'm actually going to start uh, chapter 7, verse 24, just to lead us into our uh, passage this morning. I'm going to read all the way through for Genesis 8. Chapter 7, verse 24, the waters flooded the earth for 150 days. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat. 
The waters continued to recede until the tenth month, and on the first day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After forty days, Noah opened a window he had made in the ark and sent out a raven. And it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find nowhere to perch because there was, no wa- there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. He waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again, but this time it did not return to him. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So Noah came out, together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives, all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground, and all the birds, everything that moves on land, came out of the ark, one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done, as long as the earth endures seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Um, God, we are so thankful to be able to open it up together and hear from you. So as we continue in the story of Noah, Lord, speak to us. Help us to answer this question that so many of us ask, the question of now what? Let us see that in this story. Let us see it in our lives. Let us look to you for the answer. Let us look to you for guidance. And Lord, I pray that this would be a time of worship for all of us. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're going to focus this morning on three movements uh, in this passage, three major movements and responses that happen in chapter 8. And if you look at your notes, you can see the main point for this morning. The thing that I really hope we all take away from this is don't forget the God who remembers you. Okay, don't forget the God who remembers you. And so before we get into these movements that we see in the chapter, we need to kind of start with verse 1. All right, the last two weeks, we've looked at the reason for God's judgment, the reason God's judgment was coming on the earth, and then we saw the flood, right? We saw God's judgment and how um, that happened on the face of the earth. And this week is actually um, a different week. We get to transition out of that uh, into something much more positive, much more, you know, uh, that will lead us to more joy uh, and hopefully, uh, again, more encouragement this morning. But what happens here is you have this kind of decreation of the world, and now we have this recreation. So really, the last couple of weeks, the reason for God's judgment, God's judgment comes, and now we've got this kind of, these promises and these glimmers of hope for the future, starting this week and then next week as we're in Genesis 9. But look at verse 1, and it says uh, right at the beginning there, but God remembered Noah. Okay, but God remembered Noah. And so this is the hinge. Everything in the story turns on this verse. Okay, this is where everything changes. We start to see God remake what's been undone. But God, remember, begins this new chapter, not only in our Bibles, but it begins a new chapter for Noah, begins a new chapter for humanity, for the rest of creation. These three words here, but God remembered, bring a lot of hope amidst one of the darkest periods in the history of the world. Really, nothing's rivaled this since, right? We have the entire world in this flood. Everything is destroyed. And we have, but God remembered, which is offering us this hope in the midst of a very dark period of time. The first two words alone, if you look at that, should look familiar to some of you. But God, right? But God. These are two of the sweetest sounding words in all of scripture, right? And two very powerful words filled with grace and salvation. Filled with grace and salvation. Uh, When we think of these two words together, uh, we kind of think about a very pivotal moment throughout scripture that's about to take place. Something huge is going to happen. 
And it's going to be big in salvation history. And what I mean by salvation history, I'll define it for us this morning. Uh, D.A. Carson defines it this way. Salvation history is the history of events that focus on the salvation of human beings and issues involving the new heaven and the new earth. So if I can simplify it, it means God is stepping in to do something for his people that only he can do. Okay? God is stepping in to do something for his people that only he can do. And only he can stop a flood. Right? Only he can, he, he can cause the waters to recede and only he can remake a decreated world. But as I think of the two words, but God, let's make it a little bit more personal. All right, let's make it a little bit more personal, a pivotal moment in our lives as those who follow Jesus. Uh, the Romans uh, 5 will be up on the screen here. And this is a very personal one for us, again, who call Jesus our Lord and Savior. It says this, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. And here it is, but God, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? All right? And so you see this personally, this, this moment where God comes into our lives and does something that only he can do. Enemies of him, powerless, ungodly, unable to save ourselves. He comes in and does something that only he can do. And he stepped into salvation history to do just that. And so if you're here this morning and you hear those words from Romans 5 and you see this is what God has done for you and you start asking, well, now what do I do? Right? It's very simple. Right? We repent of our sins, of that rebelliousness, of that ungodly living, and we turn to Christ and we say, thank you for what you've done on the cross for us in our place. This is the pivotal moment for many of us that are here today. We can point back to that time where there was that moment of, but God saved me. God took me out of the mess in my life and he saved me. And so again, just reminded of this as we look at this grid, big grand story of Noah, how personal this can actually be for us and what God has done. So I wish we could do more on that. Uh, it could be a whole sermon series, which I'm sure Brandon will probably do a series on that uh, in the future. But we have this closing out of judgment to this recreation. But our main concern this morning, if you look at the title of the sermon is, but God remembered. So we're going to look at that word, remembered. This is an odd word. Does it mean that God forgets? Does it mean that God forgets? That God remembers? It can feel that way sometimes, can it? It can feel that way, where we aren't really sure if God really remembers that we're there, or that we're praying, or that we're asking him for things, or that we need him. It can certainly feel like that sometimes. And it wasn't like God was just, you know, this all-knowing being who is looking over this flood-filled earth, and then he sees this ark out of the corner of his eye, and he's like, oh, man, forgot about Noah, right? Should really let them know I'm still here. You know, that's not our God. That's not our God. So what is this word remembers? Why is this the word that is used? Because for many of us, when we think of forgetting something, when we think of remembering something, it's kind of like we're at home, you know, you're kind of in your sweats and your t-shirt, whatever it is you wear when you're just at home when nobody sees you. Uh, and you get, you sit on the couch, grab your popcorn and your ice cream, you're going to watch TV and all of a sudden that alert goes off on your phone that you're supposed to be somewhere in 15 minutes. Has anybody been there? Okay. Or the knock on the door comes and you have company over and you totally forgot. Right? This is, these are real life things. So this is, hopefully you're with me. Um, but you, you get in that moment and all of a sudden there's panic that sets in and you're like, oh, I forgot about this. So you, so you get dressed, you get your panic, you rush out, you get in the car, you might get an accident, hopefully not, but you get to the place that you're going to, you open the door and you say, I've been waiting for this all day. It's good to see you. Right? We put on this like, oh yeah, I had this the whole time, but we know we forgot. We know that there was something that just missed. Is this how God looks at this situation and says, I forgot about Noah? And that's not the, what the word remember means. That's not how we see it used to talk about God and how we see it used throughout Scripture. The, the word remember means that God in his grace and mercy moves toward his people for his good, right? For, for their good, for our good, and his glory. This is the pivot again from judgment to recreation. So God remembers Noah. One commentator says it this way, and I love how he, how he puts this. 
He says God's remembering always implies his movement toward the object. Okay? Toward the object. The essence of God's remembering lies in his acting toward someone because of a previous commitment. How true is this in this story? How true is it in our life when we look at Romans 5? And so if you're not convinced uh, that this is what remember means, I'm just going to point out four quick scriptures. Uh, I'm just going to list them. They're not going to be up there. uh, Where we see God remembering people and then acting in that remembrance. So Genesis 19, God remembered Abraham, it says, and he acted by saving Abraham's nephew Lot from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He remembered, he acted. Genesis 30, God remembered Rachel and he opened her womb to have a son. Exodus 2.24, God heard the groaning of the Israelites and he remembered his covenant with Abraham and he rescued his people from slavery. First Samuel 1, God remembered Hannah by opening her womb also to have a son. And those are just some of the examples. But when God remembers, he acts. He is doing something. It's one thing to know that God never forgets us intellectually. It's another thing to know that he's actually moving towards us, that he's acting in our lives. So we must not mistake waiting on God's timing for him being forgetful. Okay? He is working. He is moving. So God's moving towards Noah. He acts towards him in this passage. So we're going to look at movement number one. So look, uh, this is God rescues and Noah waits. Okay, God rescues and Noah waits in movement number one. God's rescue is complete in chapter eight. Look at verse four. On the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. So this voyage ends. They are now at rest. That means there is enough dry land that this boat can rest on the mountains, right? There's somehow they are able to rest here. So the voyage ends and they are the only survivors, right? They're the only survivors. So God moves towards Noah. How does he do that? Uh, In verse two, it says that he sends a wind over the earth and the waters recede. And it's an interesting parallel here. We have Moses writing this for us, right? And he sees the similarities between this recreation and the Genesis one creation. All right. So the word he uses here for wind is the same word we have for spirit translated for spirit in Genesis one when the Spirit is hovering over the waters in the creation story. And here we have this wind that comes in and takes the waters away. So it just shows, again, Moses' care and understanding the similarity between these two passages, these parallels that we see in creation and recreation. So God's moving towards Noah. He's showing him that he has not forgotten him. And what is Noah's response? What is Noah's response? He waits. He waits. That's Noah's response. We need to understand if we do the math here, which is not my best subject, so I'm relying on experts, okay? Uh, The waters recede for 150 days, okay? For 150 days, so about five months, they're on the ark after everything has happened, after the judgment has taken place and they come to rest. It takes 150 days for the waters to recede. So it'll end up taking about a year, a year total on the ark. And Noah keeps waiting, Right? Noah keeps waiting. He sends out a raven. And in verse 10, after that, he, it says he waited seven more days when he sent out the dove. And then verse 12, he waited seven more days and sent the dove out again. But this time it did not return to him. So he just keeps waiting. Right? He just keeps waiting. And I'm sure no one in here struggles with waiting on God. So I'm speaking to myself. Right? But this patience on God, this understanding that I'm going to wait on him is not something that we're good at right? All right. So we have the holidays coming up. Somebody's going to get stuck at an airport, right? You're supposed to be coming home to see family or he's going to see family. Are you a pleasant person to be around when you're stuck at the airport or in the hotel, right? Are we good at waiting? Are we good at waiting on God? Magnify that by months and months and months. And this is what Noah and his family are experiencing. We've been on this boat for how long? And we're at rest on a mountain. Let's just, let's just get on the dry land and we'll move down as the waters recede, right? We'll just keep inching our way down, but we want to get out of here. We want to be on dry land. That's what I would be thinking at this time. But Noah is a patient man and he is waiting on the Lord. So many of us know that God has worked this way in our lives and maybe he's working in our life in this way now where we ask, now what? Now what, God? And there's just silence. There's just silence. There is no answer yet except to wait. I built the boat. It's been a long time. Can't we just get off? Can't you just help the waters recede a little bit faster? Right? But that's not what happens. 
For us, we ask, I've done everything you wanted me to do, God. I've been obedient. I've listened to you. I've done what you wanted me to do. I went where you wanted me to go. Why aren't you moving? Why aren't you doing something? Why don't I see it in my life? So how do we display our faith in God in those moments when the question, now what, comes? We display our faith in waiting, oftentimes. And God is very good at teaching us this lesson, right? We don't work, God doesn't work on our timetable, and he doesn't work in the exact way that we expect or would like. But like Noah, we need to wait. Noah knows God is faithful, he is merciful, he has saved him and his family. And he says, what else am I going to do? I'm going to wait on him. I'm not going to try and force his hand. I'm not going to make things happen myself. I'm not going to just work really hard. I'm going to wait on God, wait for him to tell me what he wants me to do. And so for some of us, I would include myself in this, sometimes we're waiting for things and our patience is starting to run very thin. But I want to encourage you this morning that God hasn't forgotten you. He has not forgotten you. You're not catching him off guard. Right? He's not forgotten you, and he will not. If you are a child of God, he is moving, he is acting, he is moving towards you. But just remember, there might be a period of waiting before that happens. We see that in Noah's life, and we can expect that it would happen in our lives as well. So God remembered Noah, and the beautiful thing is Noah did not forget God. Right? He waited. What makes Noah's patience even more amazing is there's nothing in the text that tells us God came and said, hey, it's going to take this long for the water to recede. All right, you're going to be on this long, just give it that time. They couldn't have some countdown in, in the ark, right? Couldn't mark down the days. They had no idea. And he continues to wait. But then we see movement number two. Movement number two, God speaks and Noah obeys. God speaks and Noah obeys. Look at verse 15. Then God said to Noah, now real quick, just again, we don't know if God spoke to Noah at all on the ark, right, while they were there. Um, the last time we have recorded for us is Genesis 7, 1 through 4, when he kind of calls them onto the ark. So it's possible that this is the first time Noah has actually heard from God since getting on the ark. But God speaks. This is his movement. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you, the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground, so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So we finally get our answer to now what? Let's get off the boat, right? Get off the ark. It's time to leave. And so it seems like this would be an easy command to follow, right? With a lot of animals on an ark for that long period of time, like come off the ark. It's fine. It's time to leave. But we have to put ourselves in their shoes for a second. We can't just glance over this. When they get out of the ark, when they're able to take the roof out, when they see they're on this mountain range, so they could probably see for quite you know, quite a distance. What do they see? Nothing. Total destruction. It's not like they're walking in, you know, we see the pictures of Noah's Ark and it's just beautiful, right? They're walking into a world that was destroyed by a flood. And so they come to the edge and we're thinking, oh yeah, come out of the boat. But the question is, what is he calling them out to? There's nothing there. I don't know if you've ever been in those situations where there's just silence. There's nothing. But that's all that would happen. They just look out, there'd be nothing. And so we have to think, okay, God has saved them, but it's almost like it's this sci-fi movie or post-apocalyptic you know, movie where you come out and just there's nothing there. And we think that's just the movies, but this is what they saw. This was reality for them. What do you mean we're supposed to come out? What are we supposed to do? There's nowhere to go. So we can't glance over that. That's a, a big thing as they are called out of the ark. But how do they respond? So, Noah, God, so God speaks to Noah, tells them to come out, and the response is they don't just wait on the ark. Verse 18. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his, wife and his sons' wives, all the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ark. One kind after another. So we have this obedience. God calls them out and they listen. God calls them out and they obey. Now this is uncomfortable because it's the unknown. It's coming to the edge and just saying, well, we're supposed to come out, but we really don't know what to do yet. We don't know what's next for us. It's the question of now what? What do we do? And the beautiful thing about what the Bible gives us is this truth that when God saves us from something, he always saves us for a purpose. 
He always saves us for something else, right? He doesn't just save us from judgment. He's taking us somewhere, and it's somewhere better than we can imagine, right? So look at verse 17. At the end, he says, So they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So here's another parallel to Genesis. Uh, I think the verse will be up for you, Genesis 128. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Who was this command given to? Adam and Eve, right? This was the creation story. God gives them this command. And now we have here in Genesis 8, after the world has gone through this global flood, God's judgment so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. God says, this is the plan. We're starting over with you, with your family, right? This is like Noah's a, a second Adam figure, right? Everything's going to start now with them, with their family. They are going to um, have that same responsibility to start over. It's a new purpose. This is something Noah wasn't expecting in his life, but now he has this role to function uh, in this role as starting over, this new beginning. So the question, now what, for them becomes a new purpose, a second chance. Noah isn't just saved from the flood, he's saved for a whole new world. And there's no one else. It's him and his family and the animals that were on the ark. And so I don't know um, about you, but I know I've heard many stories of people who come to faith in Jesus and then they ask that question, well, now what? We actually have a, um, a book downstairs for, those, you know, for kids that might pray to receive Jesus that says, now what? <laughs> well, what's next, right? Because for many of us, we pray a prayer, we say something, and we say, great, I'm saved, right? I don't want God's judgment, but we don't know where to go next. We don't know what the next steps are. Uh, and so we need to be reminded of Ephesians 2. Uh, you'll see that on the screen. Ephesians chapter 2, obviously a very popular verse, 2, 8 through 9. Uh, two through eight through ten. Sorry, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Right? God saves us, yes, but He saves us for something. He gives us a purpose. We are to do the things that He has already prepared for us to do. Save from judgment, yes but we're saved to something, something better. And so we thank Jesus for his death, for the fact that we have been saved from the judgment, but we also thank him for the fact that now we get to walk with him. We get to be more and more like Jesus as he works in our lives, in our hearts. And this is the amazing thing about the gospel, that again, we're not just saved from something. We just say, well, is that it? No, we're saved for something much better, for a new purpose, a new plan for our lives. And God is working in that. So God remembered Noah, and Noah did not forget God. He obeyed, and he came out of the ark for his new purpose. All right, so we've seen this pattern. God moving, Noah responding. Look at movement number three, though. We see a reversal of roles. Okay, so far it's been God moving, Noah responding. Now we see Noah move, and God respond. Okay, Noah move, and God responds. So they come out of the ark. Natural question, now what? All right, now what do we do? For, for me, I think if I came out of the ark, I'd look back at the ark and be like, that was a, that was a pretty good ark, right? <laughs> I mean, that thing saved us. That was some good craftsmanship. Uh, you know, it got us through. Or for some of us, we get off and we're just like, okay, God gave us a command. Let's go do it. Let's start right away. Let's rebuild the world, All right? But that's not Noah. Remember, Noah's patient. He waits on the Lord. What does he do? Verse 20, his first instinct, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And taking some of all the clean animals and the clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The first thing Noah does is acknowledge that God is there. The first thing he does, he acknowledges that God is there. He has this sacrifice, this worship, this burnt offering, which represented his thankfulness to God for all that he had done. Let's not forget what God has done in Noah's life so far. Just rapid fire here, so try and keep up. The grace God showed to him in calling him to build the ark, the promise to save him and his family, bringing the animals to him, calling him to enter the ark, protecting them while they were on the ark, bringing them to rest, causing the waters to recede, calling them out, giving them a new purpose. All of this was God. And Noah gets out and he thanks him for it. He knows that God is there. He knows what God has done. And this is the only thing he can do. I'm going to offer my worship. I'm going to offer my worship for what he has done. 
And now we get God responding to Noah. So Noah moves. God did not call for Noah to do this. He didn't say, go build an altar. All right? He didn't tell him to do this, but Noah knew his place. Noah knew who got them through this. But look at how God responds in verse 21. He says, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Right? Right before that, it says that the Lord is pleased. He is pleased with the offering. The pleasing aroma. Now, it's not that um, God is pleased with the literal smell of the sacrifice, right? He is pleased with Noah's heart. He is pleased with the fact that Noah knew who he was and wanted to thank him and worship him for all that he had done to rescue him and his family. It's because of his heart, his offering, not because the earth was going to get better. Okay? We need to remember that. This was not, hey, Noah, you guys are going to start off, and now this is the chance to be the perfect family. Right? Every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. Every inclination from childhood. That sounds awfully familiar to Genesis 6, right? Which really is kind of what got everybody in that mess in the first place. Everything in our hearts was evil. Everything welling up inside of us was, was selfish, was prideful. And that's what led to the destruction of the world, to God's judgment. So why here, knowing that this is not going to change, does God say, I'm never going to do this again? He's pleased with Noah's offering. And we see that this sacrifice that Noah gives is just a picture of a better sacrifice to come. Right? A better sacrifice to come. Because God's holiness doesn't change. He doesn't take sin less seriously now after Genesis 8 as he did before. Right? He is still holy. He still needs to respond to sin, to the rebellion that we have in our own hearts. He's still judge. He's still right. None of that has changed after the flood. He is still God. He doesn't change. So how is this possible? How does he bring reconciliation between us and him? It's with another sacrifice, right? The better sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. But here's the interesting thing. Very different than the one Noah offered. God gave this sacrifice himself. Right? God gave this sacrifice himself. The difference is that he decided to bring one man, his own son, Jesus Christ, on this earth to take the judgment that was still due, right? The judgment that was still due because of our sin and our rebellion, he decided to place it on his son and provide that sacrifice. That's why he could say, I'm never going to do this to the world again. I'm going to do it on my son. So that we didn't have to experience this again. God remembered Noah. God remembers you and me. He became one of us. Right? He became one of us. He moved toward us in taking our sin. He moved toward us in taking that sin to the cross in our place. He remembered us. He acted towards us. He has moved towards us to take us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. He has moved to take us as slaves to sin to sons and daughters of the living God. He moved toward us in helping set us free from slavery of sin. He moved toward us in giving us a new purpose, a new life. So we see the gospel message that we hold so dear is right here in Genesis. It's right here in the story of Noah. How do we see that? Because like Noah, we find favor in the eyes of God, right? We have God's grace on us, not because of anything we did. Noah didn't deserve it. We don't deserve it. Every inclination of our heart is evil. God's grace comes for us. It rests on us, just like it did Noah. Like Noah, God provides a way of rescue from his judgment, not in an ark this time, as we talked about two weeks ago, but in and through a person, in and through the work and life of Jesus. That is where we find our rest. That is where we find our rescue. Like Noah, when God saves us, he calls us to a new purpose. 2 Corinthians 5, very famous passage, what it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Sound familiar? Right? The old has gone, the new has come. And then he says, we have a message and a ministry of reconciliation. That's what we have. That's our new purpose. That's his plan for us. To be the ones that get into people's lives and see them change as he works in their hearts because we have this message and ministry of reconciliation. And finally, like Noah, we worship God with our lives and God promises that there is no condemnation 
for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? That was experienced by Christ on the cross for us. So now we live in freedom. We live with a new purpose, always coming back like Noah, worshiping and thanking him for what he has done. And so my encouragement again, as I said earlier, don't forget the God who remembers you. Because he does remember you. He remembers us. He acts towards us. So the question is, what do we do? How do we make sure we don't forget? Or should I say, as we leave, now what? What do we do? What's next? Well, we take the Apostle Paul's words to heart in Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Because he gave up his life, we give up ours. Right? We give up ours. We live for him. We worship him with the way that we act. We worship him with the things that we say. We worship him by thanking him for what he has done for us in our place. So let us not forget the God who remembers us. Let's pray. Lord, we, we are amazed by the fact that your grace would come on us. Those who choose other things besides you all the time. We make lesser things into the gods we follow. It's hard for us to wait. But while all of that is happening, Lord, you remember us. You act toward us. And so, Lord, let us not forget who you are, what you've done, how you want to work in our lives. Thank you for the story of Noah. Thank you for showing us that this was pointing to you, pointing to the work that you were going to do in salvation history by doing what only you could do in our lives, in our hearts, for us. So Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.